it's hard to escape the conclusion that something out of the ordinary has happened to our weather. Across the globe, a pattern is emerging. From Japan, to Greece, to the Arctic Circle, to here in the UK. The question, of course, is what is happening? I would be pretty certain that you couldn't have had this hot air, this heat event that we've got at the moment without climate change. Professor Joanna Hay is a climate scientist at Imperial College London. It's not proof, you can't really put it like that. What you can say is that these events are becoming increasingly common and where they used to be uncommon, uh, and now they are more usual, that is probably associated with climate change. You say probably, how certain in your mind are you? Well, the sorts of temperatures um, that are um, occurring now would have been a one in a thousand occurrence in the 1950s, and now they're about a, a one in 10 occurrence. And that's because the average temperature is moving up so the extremes are getting less extreme. So how extreme? Well, if we take the average temperature for January to June from 1910 to the year 2000, and we use that as our benchmark, and then we plot every year from 1880 to 2018 to show how far above or below that average line they fall, well, the pattern is very clear. The world is getting warmer and warmer. 2018 was actually 0.77 of a degree centigrade above the average, which is the fourth hottest year on record for the period, behind 2015, 2017 and 2016, all very recent history. As for that famous 1976 heat wave, although the summer was hot, the average for January to June was actually slightly colder than the long-term trend. According to scientists then, we can expect to see more long, hot summers like this one. But that means we're going to have to make some changes. The Environmental Audit Committee of the House of Commons will be publishing a report on Thursday looking at how we'll need to adapt to more frequent heat waves. There's no, not really a problem with it today or tomorrow. And the issue is also that um, heat-related deaths tend to turn up in retrospect. So nobody turns up at, on, at the hospital and says, I'm dying of heat. But actually, we can, w there tends to be a, a time lag before we realise what has happened. So there isn't that pu the pressure on policymakers that I think there needs to be. And there, this is a cross-government issue. So DEFRA has responsibility for adapting to climate change. But many of the other departments, such as uh, homes and local government, Government, uh, the Department for Transport are the ones where actually the rubber literally hits the melting road. One of the big problems is that we have building regulations designed for a colder Britain. New build properties are constructed to keep the heat in during freezing winters, not let it out during boiling summers. So what we want to see is, is better uh, adaptation of our buildings for these hotter temperatures, particularly our homes, schools, hospitals and care homes as well. And at the moment that's not happening. So we don't see any uh, standard or requirement at present in government to uh, adapt these new builds when they're being designed. And we'd also like to see an increase in the amount of urban green space in, in urban areas to protect people more from high temperatures. But that's actually going down rather than going Meanwhile, the heat is brewing up thunder, with the Met Office issuing storm warnings for Friday for the north and east of England. However, it's not clear that we've seen the last of the hot weather for this year, let alone for the summers to come. Well, that was David Grossman there, and I'm joined now by the Met Office's chief scientist, Stephen Belcher, and by Dr Chris Hope from the University of Cambridge. He's worked as a climate change advisor to the UK government and to the Obama administration, was a lead author for the third and fourth assessment reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which won a Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. Very nice um, to have you both here. And uh, Stephen Belcher, if I can start with you, I, I use the phrase the new normal. Do you think this is now something that we have to get used to? Well, the heat wave that we're seeing at the moment, the jet stream has had a very, it's kind of got stuck, mm. which is rather unusual. And that's give us a, given us a period of high pressure over the UK, which has led to this very warm uh, weather. And as your piece said, the Met Office are forecasting mid 30 degrees uh, towards the end of this week. And it's a reminder of what the climate can throw at us. So is it the new normal? Well, let's think back to 1976, there are actually some characteristics of this event that look rather like 1976. Um, one of the things that we think is driving that stuck jet stream 
uh, the sea surface temperature patterns in the Atlantic, in the North Atlantic, and they look strikingly similar to what we saw in 1976. However, what we didn't see in 1976 was this band of heat waves right around the Northern Hemisphere. So 1976 was very localized around the UK. Now we're seeing heat waves in Scandinavia, in Japan, as your earlier piece described. So since 1976, the global mean temperature has risen by more than half a degree. So any extremes that we get are superimposed upon that warming. So it makes it more likely that these extreme events are going to give us higher temperatures. And you would suggest by that that this will happen more often then? I mean, if it doesn't happen next year, of course, there'll be a chorus of people saying, oh, you see, sure. it was all rubbish and nothing happened at all. If it doesn't happen next year or the year after, do you then revert... Do we revert to mean, as it were? So the heat wave that we've got is probably part of natural cycles in the weather, subject to analysis, and we've got a big programme of work at the Met Office studying this, but it's superimposed on this background of global warming, and that's what's elevating our temperatures. So if we think back, another heat wave that's very important for Europe was the 2003 heat yeah. wave. Okay. Um, and work led by the Met Office, we were able to show that uh, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere doubled the chance of the temperatures we saw in 2003 compared to what we'd expect in a pre-industrial world. And furthermore, by the 2040s, the temperatures we saw in 2003 would be an average summer. So a couple of years ago, we had another look at that to see how we were tracking towards that projection that 2003 would, would look a normal summer. Uh, for Europe by the 2040s. And actually, we're right on track. If you look at temperatures across Europe, they're tracking that projection mm. that by 2040s, 20, uh, 2003 temperatures... We're crossing that dot. We're, we're, we're looking like they will be normal. So for you, uh, Chris Hope, if you're looking at the economics of this change now, where do you start telling the government they should be putting their money? I mean, how do you make the preparations? Well, as Stephen has said, and as your report showed, the temperature rise that we've seen up to date has been about one degree compared to pre-industrial times. And if we carry on as we have been doing in terms of emitting the greenhouse gases, then it's likely that by the end of this century, the temperature will have risen by probably four degrees. It may be three, it may be six, but around about four degrees. And so we would expect to see far more of these kind of events occurring. We would expect to see sea level rise, and we would expect to see some rather more frightening things certainly possibly occurring, like a more rapid melting of ice in the Arctic, release of... Uh, can we cope with that in this country? Well, in this country, we can cope with it by some adaptation, we can grow different crops, we can make sure that we're protected against some of the sea level rise of half a metre to one metre. But the risks are, if it carries on going in this sort of way and we don't do anything mm. about it, then it will get beyond our ability to adapt to it. And therefore, we have to try and take action to bring down it, our emissions of greenhouse gases. Of course, you don't want to work towards it, I can see that. But at the moment, if you are talking to those in agriculture or those planning our cities or housing, what what, what are you having to adapt or what are you telling them to change to well, prepare? What I'm telling people in government and what the government is taking notice of both in America in the previous Obama administration and also analysis that was done for the Treasury in this country is that what we need to have is a level playing field. We need to make sure that we charge people who are emitting greenhouse gases for the damage that they are causing. We need to have a very strong... Uh, on, a, on an individual consumer basis? Basis or on an industry basis? It needs to be a strong climate change tax, probably starting around about $100 per tonne of carbon dioxide. It needs to be comprehensive because if we're going to avoid this rise in temperature to four degrees, we need to take really serious action and therefore it needs to be on all sectors, agriculture, industry, but also domestic energy use. It needs to rise over time because as we get closer to the date when these serious effects are likely to occur, the damage from putting one more tonne mm. of greenhouse gas into the atmosphere gets higher and Could higher. Could you see this being sold um, to a government politically? 
Well, what we saw in 2015 in the Paris uh, Conference of the Parties was 197 countries come together and propose plans for how they would reduce uh, That's greenhouse That's a long gas way off, though, isn't it, emissions. to an actual taxation it on is, the individual starting from now. But it's 197 countries yeah. coming to agreement. And I think one of the landmark scientific contributions ahead of that was to understand how, as we add more as we add each tonne of carbon to the atmosphere, how much global warming mm. we might expect. So that gives us a budget as an international community for how much carbon we can emit to stay below those ambitious Gr targets. But of briefly, is there any Paris. upside to what is happening now? I mean, can you look and see the savings, for example, on fuel? Do we worry less about, you know, security of fuel? Would you be looking at an upside to this? Any upside that we've seen would probably have been in the past with temperatures rising maybe a half a degree or something like that. We're certainly getting into this state where mm. we're not seeing an upside, we're seeing a downside. And the way to sell this argument, and it's been accepted by more than 50 governments and uh, organisations across the world, is to say when you put this climate change tax on fossil fuels, you reduce the taxes on other things, on income, right. on sales, on national insurance. You reduce so you the tax your priority, you reduce you the taxes on things you want to encourage, like employing people, and you put the taxes on things you want to discourage, like emissions of greenhouse gases, and we can make the economy work better by doing that. Gentlemen, thank you both very much. Thanks for coming in.